Hi, this is Kyle Newman, and you're listening to the FSF Popcast. The show where the emperor craps his robe and calls for timeout. No, seriously, timeouts are a thing, guys. Our show is brought to you by our charity sponsor, the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund, which supports the Wish Upon a Teen Foundation that helps out sick kids when they need it most. And just imagine the comfort you'll give Red Shirt Crewman number 130. He'll know that when he puts on the red shirt and joins Eric, Hutch, Windows, Linus, and Zoe on their cross-country trip to see the screening of episode one, that he didn't leave his family destitute and without hope. Because Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund has his back and what's left of the booze. All right, guys, our guest today is a director and producer of some of the best nerdy content out there, whether it's movies, documentaries, or shorts, uh, all the above. They're very entertaining. His credits include Return of Return of the Jedi, a Raiders fan film, uh, the upcoming Disturbance in the Force. There's a movie called One Up. You can watch that on Amazon Prime. It's about uh, girls, esports, gaming. It's actually very entertaining. I watched that this morning. Good times there. Uh, and one of my all-time favorite movies, and I'm not underselling this. Seriously, this movie is included in all of my Star Wars chronological watching because it leads up to episode one. It's, as far as I'm concerned, frankly, it's canon, um, or at least it should be. And that movie is Fanboys. So I'm super proud and very pumped to introduce Kyle Newman to the FSF podcast. Welcome to the show, Kyle. Thank you for that introduction. Well, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Um, now, looking over all the things that you've done, Kyle, I, I can honestly say that I think we could talk for hours on end about all the nerdy stuff that you've had your fingers into and all the stuff that you've been part of. Um and just you've you've got some really cool nerdy credits out there on IMDb. And there's some of the stuff I have to go hunt down because I I now need to see some of the stuff like the Raiders fan film. And there's uh, you have a D&D thing coming up and a few other things. And, and I'm very excited about this stuff because <clears throat> nerd. And so but yeah, so we're just going to start off with a few questions and see where we go. So now that I've set the table, first and foremost. I love to ask anyone who's involved in Star Wars in any way, shape, or form, whether they're a fan or they've been involved in some other capacity like you have been with uh, your Disturbance in the Forest documentary that's upcoming, your movie Fanboys, and all these other things. What was your entry point into Star Wars, and what keeps you coming back to the universe? Well, my entry point was way back in summer of 77. I was one over one years old, and we, my family went to see, I guess, Star Wars at a, a drive-in theater. And I don't remember because I was so little, but I remember some energy of like my, my relatives, my cousins, and everyone was electric. And it just stayed with me. It stayed in the zeitgeist. And I just grew up as a little guy collecting Star Wars toys, inheriting them from my older brothers. I would, I would, they would get a do-back dinosaur in the Kenner box and come home. And I'd be like, too, and I'd be like wanting to rip it open and <laughs> have to hide things from me. So I just became fanatical. Star Wars was everything from the day I was born, basically. It's all I knew. So as soon as I could absorb content, it was Star Wars. What keeps me coming back is uh, now hope. Hope that um, the good stuff's going to keep coming, that they're going to get it right. Um, hope that they keep bringing in people that love star wars and want to see it evolve and keep it elevated that want to see star wars at the forefront of technology and storytelling star wars i think needs to be synonymous with innovation and not just be good content and i think we're at the point where we're just like well it's is it good or is it bad is, this week was good this week was better than good this week was okay it should always be groundbreaking in my opinion uh because that's that's the benchmark that george set so I hope we get back there. I hope it's um, the top, the highest tier entertainment on more than one level. And um, good Star Wars has depth. You know, it's not just entertaining. It also has depth. It's spiritual. It makes you think. It makes you feel something. And it's fun. And it's yeah. intense. And it taps into something dark. Um, so... That's why I think you keep coming back because when it's done right, Star Wars has everything. I agree. I couldn't agree more, honestly. Um, and everything you just said there is how I felt about the last series, Andor, and everything that that brought to the table. And and it just, that series to me, it left me with so much hope 
for what the future of Star Wars could be and should be moving forward that I personally, I was just every week. I, I'm I'm excited to watch Mandalorian. Don't get me wrong. Every week, I you know, I, Wednesday morning, I sit down at, at my computer and I have my monitor there while I'm doing other things. I have the Mandalorian. Uh, but when it was during the Andor series, I don't think I allowed any other distractions. You know, I was like, I have to watch this. I have to pay attention to this because everything that was going on, it was it was so engrossing to me. Tension. I mean, yeah. it's it demands your attention and you have to pay attention to the details and also it's it's got a lot of nuance to it mm -hmm. i think because episodes breathe a little more they are able to imbue it with some more character moments subtlety um obviously it has a darker maybe more mature tone to it um there's there's an edge to it as well which i think is, is good star wars can have that i think star wars when done right has a, can have a little bit of everything um and it can be they can be a little different Mandalorian's mm -hmm. a little different than Bad Batch. It's a little different than Obi Wan. It's a little different yeah. than Clone Wars. It's a little different than Rebels. And it's a little different from, you know, we're getting with with uh, Andor. So, um, I think there's room in the spectrum of Star Wars for it, and I thought it was fantastically written. And that's really comes down to first the writing, um, and that was one of the strengths of that show. It was well plotted, and there's really good character development, and there's an unpredictability to it, and periphery characters uh periphery with quotes you know mon mothma and people like that which really aren't your you would have a whole series just about her but having subplots yeah. about her yeah. uh, storylines as rich as they are it's amazing uh and i love seeing that getting another look at some place we think we're familiar with like coruscant or or political system in yeah. the galaxy and getting all these other extra layers to peel off that was awesome um how rebellion came to be again these are the things we've always been fascinated about so getting these deep dives this is what the series offers i think is great i think you know there's stuff i loved in obi-wan mm -hmm. uh, overall i think you know again it was some of it was the writing it wasn't totally totally there some of the set pieces were it had you know, its moments battle in the middle of it and they fight in like a rock quarry in pennsylvania and you're like the third episode, you're like, this is just a rock quarry in Pennsylvania. Like, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know? Even the Lego toy, it's garbage. Um, but then, it, then there's a couple of amazing battles in it, and the stuff with Anakin and, and um, Obi Wan is incredible. So, yeah, there's always something that blows me away in these shows. But there's also, and I, I keep it honest, you know, I don't talk about other movies or other filmmakers or whatever, but I, I will analyze Star Wars. It's been part of my life in that way, and I'm always positive, and I always come back and I always talk about what's good about it. But I thought, you know, that needed a little more time in the oven, mm -hmm. the, the script. Yeah, probably. And I think same thing with with Boba Fett, you know. Mm -hmm. and I think the, the trickle effect of Boba Fett is the structuring of how it affects Mandalorian Season 3. And there's some spoilers here. But going back to the armorer so she could tell him again, apparently two years later, that you can't be a Mandalorian anymore, felt redundant. You know, we already got that information. It should have. And then he goes the same episode. He like flies across the galaxy, spends 28 grand on fuel, probably for a, a four day trip to go <laughs> see Bo Katan for a 45 second conversation. They didn't even, they could have at least like got some pizza together or something. They do nothing. She just walks in, she's waiting for him. She says, blah, blah, blah. At least that, I mean, that, that series should have opened with him going to Bo Katan season three mm -hmm. and him helping her in some way, stick a monster in that. And then, She's like, yeah, and he's like, tells her why he's there because he's already been on this quest, which he's already realized I have to go to the to the living waters. So now he visits her. Then she gives him junk, which is that crystal, you know, um, mm -hmm. which lets him realize there's more to it and sends, she sends him on a fool's errand. And then it also sets up what you need to do is to bring her into play. So Grogu had someone to go to to get help for her to c come back and maybe go on a new spiritual journey. But there's just a greater efficiency could have been had you know, in the writing, it's just like take an extra day, a weekend, talk mm -hmm. to someone, tighten this stuff up. Yeah. Um, because there's also conflicting messages Bo Katan's giving in that as well, like compared to other other scenes, previous scenes, how she talks about Mandalore versus uh mm -hmm. and, what's going on and how her opinions changed a bit pretty quickly. So I don't know. I love it, but I also just wish it was a little little tighter on the, the screenwriting front. I feel I, like that's so true with so much of Star Wars too, though, is the, you love it and yet we can see and we can list all of these flaws with it, but we're also going to defend it with our lives. Like, I love 
Phantom Menace. I defend I've done panels at Star Wars Celebration, Prequel Appreciation Society, and uh, Filoni would come and we'd all do these panels. And I love it, but I still have very honest critiques. And I love George mm-hmm. Lucas. I'm going to give you the same critiques. There's about two minutes of dialogue you cut out of that movie and you you can increase its efficiency and potency. Um, Incredibly. Tenfold. You know, just, yeah. just little little things, you know. Um, but there's, there's a whole section of episode two I'd love to cut out. But <laughs> yeah, and, and I would say, you know, of, of the prequels, episode two is probably my least favorite. And I have, you know, gripes with that, but I still love the prequel trilogy and the sequel trilogy. Agreed. You know, I love the sequel trilogy um, to Agreed. a degree. Um, but I, I love the casting in it. You know, JJ, oh, yeah, an incredible cast. He conjectures some amazing stuff. I think the ball was completely dropped with Last Jedi. Um, and JJ was left with an impossible task to come back in. And the problems Rise of Skywalker has, there's problems. But at least tonally, it's getting back to a place that's that's fun. And there's a lot of you know inconsistencies or things like that don't make sense to me. But I still, um, for some reason, have fun with it. I just, I love Daisy Ridley. I love Adam Driver. And I love them together. I love World yeah. World. Um And yeah, but there's, I, I love seeing the Emperor back. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, Somehow but, the Emperor returned. <laughs> You know what are you gonna do when someone kills the villain of your fr- of your of your trilogy in the middle of a the second movie? You kind of like where where, where, where are you going? Right, so yeah. They had, to, they had to do things to correct big mistakes. Um, Agreed. And they didn't really have the time to prep it properly, I think, or the time to pull it off because you need to kind of like go into Act Three of a trilogy and set up a new villain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a tall order. So yeah, um, yeah. So Kyle, with all nerds. There's not just a single faceted nerd. I mean, you are a Star Wars fan through and through. But from your Twitter feed, from your books, you are also a tabletop RPG fan. So what was your introduction into tabletop RPGs? And do you have a favorite character build? Oh, tabletop RPG. Okay, so way back, my older brothers would also play Dungeons & Dragons. They were at Boy Scout camp, and I was visiting them one day. Uh, I forget what it was early 80s. I was really little. And they were playing a homebrewed version using um advanced D D. Uh, but it was Indiana Jones. And mm. it was so cool. So I wouldn't play. I would sit off to the side like Elliot and ET and I'd watch them play <laughs> how to draw because of like monster manual and things like that. So I loved it. I, I got very heavily into West End game Star Wars RPG. I got okay. into the Ninja Turtles RPG. I get into GURPS, uh Supers uh group space i also got into like car wars so i, I would do different things as well as dungeons dragons so i love dungeons dragons um i didn't play it for a long time and when i had kids i i don't go out anyway i don't drink i don't party i've never done anything in my life i i like games i like movies games etc so i would have people over for for games we were doing a star wars rpg and my game master was sam whitwer and sam was going away i think to vancouver to do a show and he had to take three months off and we didn't want to start a new star wars group so uh it was early 2015 and and there was a new edition of dungeon dragon so we formed a group and started playing that we still play that uh to this day so it's been going almost eight years our tuesday night game and um as soon as i was back into DD, i was like well, what have i missed what have i not been doing for the past 18 20 years what's been out and about. And I picked up fourth edition, but I didn't really play it, but I flipped through it. I had no one to play with at the time. And so I was kind of aware, but I wanted to know what I missed. And there were all these books back in the day, like different art of art of dragon magazine and art of, you know, dragon lands and things like that. But there was nothing that had encapsulated the, the, the spectrum of what encompassed you know, D and D and all its various mm-hmm. um, campaign settings. So I was like, I want to make a book about this, which is kind of a crazy idea. And I ended up partnering with Sam Whitwer and his brother, Michael Whitwer, and another uh, game historian, John Whitwer, John Peterson. And we created um, a very large coffee table history of D&D book for Wizards of the Coast and for Penguin Random House. And it's as much a history as it is a visual history that kind of takes you from D&D's origins, pre-D&D up through, uh, at that point, it was 2018, up through the middle of fifth edition. And we're actually following it up right now. Uh, which will be very soon, uh, Lee announced uh, um, a book that's going to pick up where that one left off. It's coming out. So another coffee table um, book, deep dive into the brand. Um, I also got to do a Dungeons and Dragons 
the official cookbook. Mm -hmm. Ooh, great. Heroes Feast. And um, we're going to be playing more in that space, too, in a, in a big way. So there's some more things coming on under that title. Um, and that's also big stuff coming this summer and fall. Um, so getting to play in these IPs that I love is awesome because they meant so much to me as a kid. I wish I could do more in the world of Star Wars. I'd love to do a Star Wars Star Wars cookbook, but not just one that's like, you know, the Wookiee cookie stuff. I want right. to get into culturally what would um what would these different races really eat what would happen on these different planets what's really available to them that would make right. up their diet rather than going to eat something different than a trend ocean yeah well, not 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 to make it name gimmicked but to really get into it and that's what we did with our first first heroes we spoke we really got into like how what's the difference between a halfling a dwarf a gnome Mm -hmm. um, an elf what are those different traits and the philosophies behind it culturally they live different they live one lives 900 years one lives 100 years you know mm -hmm. how you approach food and life and recreation and religion changes because of just how long you live what mm -hmm. where you live how close to the equator you live and i think that'd be fascinating to do something as um immersive and deep dive for star wars that would be really cool. That would be I cool. know the Heroes Feast cookbook is actually on my my wish list of cookbooks currently. Which I think you'll like it. It it's sounds weird to have really a wish list cool. of cookbooks, but it, it's in there. I'm, with uh, I'm I can't. I'm really proud of it, and the feedback's been great. And um, if you're into D and D, there's also a lot of lore in there too. So it mm -hmm. really lets you get a, a snapshot of these different playable races and if you're into like i really want to learn about elves it lets you look at them from a perspective that isn't just combat um yeah. so it's pretty cool i never thought that i would be into like themed cookbooks like that until a friend of ours gave us a skyrim cookbook for our wedding anniversary and i'm like well this is fantastic this is great i never thought that i'd want to make something and pretend that it's horker loaf but this is this is awesome yeah and same I saw one, I was a couple of years ago, I was at a Barnes and Nobles and I saw a World of Warcraft cookbook and I was like, what mm. is this? You know, this is a thing, this is a thing, you know, and then it cut to a few years later, I'm like making a cookbook and I think it's, it's actually really cool, especially when you're playing an RPG where it's all about immersion and adding a fourth dimension, uh, experiential quality to it. And you want to feel as much a part of the world. It gives you something else that triggers another sense beyond yeah. just the, you know, the mind's eye type of theater of the mind role-playing um there's something else that can be put on your table and look like role-playing games it's just like eating you get together at a table it's communal mm -hmm. you talk you spend a few hours doing it and you're gonna if you're gonna role play why eat cheetos and taco bell you can eat like really good stuff that ties in right. your, your your campaign and some everyone can bring a different thing and there's there's something really fun about it that can that can um just it just it's what do you do with those other six nights of the week when it's not your game night too you know i like right. that thing like with star wars i love star wars books i love reading star wars art books i, lo I love you know going on toy sites and looking what's about what's coming out looking at all the vintage figures that are going to be unavailable at my local target and i'll never get um so there's other there's so many aspects beyond just the content we consume mm -hmm. so yeah. very cool i'm gonna have to get heroes feast and do like a big Dungeons and Dragons dinner, one of our game nights. That'll be fun. I endorse. This. There you go. That would be uh, so much fun. I was thinking you do Kashyyyk fried chicken. <laughs> you have to call it porg, though. Oh, that's right, porg. I I knew it was porg. I meant to say porg. Kashyyyk fried I was, porg. Absolutely. I just got chicken on the mind. <laughs> did you do some pulled, no, I did porg? Barbecue pulled porg. Barbecue hey. pulled porg. Oh, that oh, that sounds <laughs> wonderful. Um. Yeah, and you know, Galaxy's Edge, I've been to Galaxy's Edge, and they have some interesting food there. Uh, the blue milk is definitely better than the green milk um, for numerous reasons. Nice. Um, but yeah, the, the green milk tastes like armpit sweat. Oh, A little bit of <laughs> Woo, okay like a little bit of gelatin and, and on ice <laughs> and also just it's it's something out of the last jedi i just don't vibe with it so i'm just i'm not buying it huh. there, there you go fair enough 
So kind of sticking with the D&D theme, I was scanning through your IMDb and noticed some upcoming projects, and one that caught my attention was the Dungeons & Dragons documentary. Could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, we've been trying to bring this to life for a few years. Uh, like I said, it's, it's, we did a history book on Dungeons & Dragons, and it's history, um, visually, it's visual history, and it's, you know, pop culture history and it's business history um and it also be fascinating to do a deep dive into this brand why something that's so intrinsically analog like an rpg pencil and paper rpg why is it thriving in the digital age right now it's, it's having they're having it's, its biggest moment there's 50 mm -hmm. million players worldwide there's a huge motion picture which opens in a couple of weeks um younger and younger people are playing the game the barrier of entry the stigmas on it have been stripped away fantasy is back bigger than ever you've seen things like lord of the rings and harry potter and game of thrones everyone's like oh i like fantasy oh i guess i am into this stuff like that's D, &D i guess okay so people are very receptive to it and the game's having a renaissance and the 50th anniversary is next year so uh we were going to do it as a docuseries and end up getting shaped back into a feature and it is a celebrity laden um but real historical deep dive with all the guys who helped build the game a lot of archival footage um and all the the different stewards who have uh taken over the various editions of DD &D and tried to do it justice reinvent the game but also carry the spirit of it forward and it it really tracks the game conception what games inspired D, D to become its own original new thing in 1974 when it burst onto the scene and what are those you know large events in history that conspired against it or inspired it to um reach new heights things like the satanic panic in the early 80s which oh, was, sure yeah you know pervasive in heavy metal music and other things um but why was there a satanic panic you know what was going on in the american culture and zeitgeist that was making people like there's movies like the exorcist and those other things were capturing people's attention so there's a reason for americana and american you know midwest to revolt against it and burn books and do all these things so all these things are just various subplots in it and it's it's got some incredible people that you wouldn't believe uh you played dnd &D, from stephen colbert to tiffany haddish you know there's like mm -hmm. all types of people have been affected by dnd &D, all types of mm -hmm. storytellers and showrunners and musicians and um everybody's got a really interesting origin story and, and why they also came back to it and what it means to them so all that stuff intersects with this larger than life almost impossible to believe history of this game and and how it's had all these ups and downs and keeps getting resurrected impossibly so um it's it's really cool it'll be out early next year i was awesome. just looking into it a little and i'm like oh of course joe's involved in it <laughs> yeah. so joe joe is and i are co-directing it That's and right. joe and his brother and i were also all uh different producers on it and we're doing it with e1 who um e1's part of um entertainment arm of hasbro mm -hmm. and hasbro is the parent company of wizards of the coast which owns you know hasbro owns wizards of the coast which is the dungeons and dragons and magic the gathering so it's gonna be so cool and i mean it's, obviously you're gonna it's have... gonna be awesome it's going to have critical role in it because that's been a huge of course matt huge mercer and mish ray we've interviewed uh, everyone you can you can possibly conceive of that has touched upon dungeons and dragons in as, some as my laura bailey dice bag of holding is is on my bed <laughs> behind me and i'm just like oh there you, go. you got to talk so matt, matt mercer is is an incredible uh man and what he's created is so mm -hmm. so of course we, we sit and we chat with that Oh, very cool I'll be... everything that they have done in the last eight years is just i love the animated show too it's great yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. and then going from season two of vox machina to then being told that there's going to be a mighty nine version as well and i'm like mm -hmm. did that get announced really I'm yes excited. They, okay. they announced it just at the end of season two of vox machina they announced that they are working on mighty nine that's cool. awesome which i think is amazing I'm excited because I'm going over to uh, GaryCon this upcoming week. So, oh, you're going? It's great. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. 
All right, Kyle, let's go from one documentary to another. You sent us a screener for a movie called Disturbance in the Force, which is about uh, the Star Wars holiday special. So thanks for that. That was actually a really fun watch. Um, I, I, I loved the juxtaposition of people who both loved it and hated it at the same time. And, and even for some of them in the same breath. Uh, when they were talking about the holiday special, talked about what they loved, but then it was like you could hear the brakes uh, in their in their in their brain just getting slammed down, and then why they hated it, but then go right back to why they loved it. So for those who uh, yet obviously have yet to see the movie because it isn't out yet, but uh, even or who have not seen the Star Wars holiday special, what was the impetus for starting this project, and why should people watch? Why should people watch the train wreck that is the Star Wars holiday special? And I put it that way because. My favorite quote from the from the documentary is right at the end, and I can't remember the gentleman's name who said it, and I apologize for that, but I love this. He says, sometimes the magic happens, and sometimes it's the Star Wars holiday special. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a very good quote. Um, why did it happen? Well, I think, well, the, the two directors, and I'm a producer on it, it uh, Jeremy Coons and Steve Kovacs, they... Um, started this journey and they were trying to sit down with everyone who'd ever been in, involved in the making of it. Um, so there's two directors, one mm -hmm. replaced the other. Steve Binder came in um, and replaced Acosta. And then there's the writers, Lenny Rips, and you've got Bruce Valanche and assistant directors, and you've got um, costume designers and some of the dancers from it. And, Lucas and liaisons, just different ex-employees, people that were around part of the Star Wars, uh, Lucasfilm, uh, Star Wars Corporation, Lucasfilm. What was going on right there in that in the late 70s, pre-Empire Strikes Back era? And so they tracked down as many of these people as they could, and they were checking them off. And and some of some some pop culture names came up too. People that we felt like, you know, well, how did it affect them? Guys like Weird Al Yankovic or Kevin mm -hmm. Smith or Seth Green. And we realized there was a greater, just not just about the people that worked on it, but the greater conversation about how it, how did these people discover it? How did they feel about it? How did it conflict with their, their brand newfound passion, their adoration of star wars in 1977 so in 1978 you've got this holiday special on cbs and clearly um it didn't it didn't stick with people and it hasn't aired since so there's probably a reason what what did people that saw it back then feel like what were those initial reactions and how does it stand the test of time and and also just debunking some some myths about it and also revealing some new truths and I think the most important thing was not just to say, oh, the holiday special is bad, da dum 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 there's the joke. You know, everyone knows right. it's not amazing. But there's some fascinating stuff in it. It's really the how and the why is what's interesting. And it's a very unique slice of time, 1978, where George has his eye firmly set on Empire Strikes Back and getting that film off the ground, investing all his own money into it and starting his uh, new company um, and all his other ventures. But he also has to keep Star Wars in the zeitgeist. He has to keep his investment relevant. He has to keep it fresh. He's got to keep people going to the theaters and the action figures were delayed. So he's right. got to make sure Star Wars, which is where he has a big slice of uh, the pie, this stuff is selling and it's relevant and it doesn't mean Star Wars, you know, make sure it wasn't Star Wars when Flash and Pan. And by the time Empire comes back, people have moved on to something else mm -hmm. uh, like Xanadu. Um, so he's... <laughs> and, um, <laughs> So he's doing a little too much, you know, he brings on Irvin Kirshner to go do Empire, but he's still heavily involved in, in the writing and the breaking of the story and the prepping of the movie. And this special goes from being like a one hour special to a two hour variety special. So George has a very big influence on the outset, the, the initial story, the concept of it and a Wookiee right. fan. And in some of his earlier writing and things he's mused about other story sessions, he talked about doing like a very domestic almost hobbit hole like mm -hmm. step into the wookie world domestic slice of life wookie family um and some of that obviously carries over into this holiday special but what the where the train wreck happens is that 
they plug it into variety show. And this wasn't something like Star Wars invented the variety show and Star Wars did this thing, a variety show, and it was so bad and they, they, they invented the format. The format was almost the preeminent format in the late 70s. And people would go market their stuff on, on these shows from Donnie and Marie to Bob Hope and Richard Pryor. And all these shows were, you know, Muppet Show, everybody, there was all these type of shows. Right. And of course, Star Wars was then plugged into it and partook in the genre itself by doing its own holiday special. And you have to understand variety TV and late seventies Americana. And that's what we try to bring to the conversation is an understanding of what was going on there and why, why did it take this shape and form and why was Jefferson starship on it? And why is Diane Carroll on it? And who were the other people that <laughs> almost got cast because they did, this wasn't the intended cast. It wasn't supposed to be correct. Art Carney and B Arthur. It, there were, and Harvey Corman, there were, bigger, less television-y names that were supposed to be on this show. It didn't all work out. Um, and like I said, change of directors and change of direction and change of format. And it became watered down. It became over, you know, over budget. It, it got off the rails. And it really just look at the, George, the level of George's involvement, try to get to the bottom of, you know, where he stepped out of the picture and who took over and what their skill sets were. And maybe they were ill-equipped to see this thing through. So it's, it's amazing the recollection that some of these old uh, behind the scenes luminaries uh, had because mm -hmm. they retain a lot of it. And they, they tell some fascinating stories about set life. And this is back in 1978, you know, yeah. it's incredible. Um, and when you think about filmed Star Wars content, this is the second thing that ever came out there. You know, you had the movie and then you had this and it birthed Boba Fett. You got an incredible animated sequence. We get into that. And then also, why is that on Disney Plus and nothing else? Why do they talk about Life Day and everything from the Lego special sure. to... The Mandalorian has talks about Life Day. The theme parks have Life Day and Life Day toys, but we won't talk about the holiday special. Um, I remember there was a there's a book years ago, The Star Wars Vault. In the back of it was a CD of Princess Leia, you know, singing her Carrie Fisher singing her. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Closing song. I was like, wait, they put out the song like this is legit. Like, and you get the, the CD with the song. So it's it's interesting that some things are taboo and some things are okay. And I think mm -hmm. maybe because of time, it softened um, George's stance on it. It doesn't seem like he's so adamant against it. I think he's just retired in a lot of ways and doesn't care. Um, so that's something he is just actively on his mind. It's a, it's a part of history I'm sure he'd like to forget, but I think it's important in Star Wars history because the degree to which it was a failure, the degree to which George Lucas, I think it pained him how this turned out, influenced sure. how that George make sure he could steward and shepherd and protect his creation moving forward. And that's why you see George being much more precious and particular about how Star Wars and its its characters and its IP could be depicted and used in in other content. Um, oh, I think it was a huge learning uh, a huge learning set, uh, time for George and how yeah. he moved forward. You know, and the movie's and, not done. Just you know, you guys saw it's not done. We we still have more interviews to do. We got accepted oh, okay. by Southwest, and we're like, awesome. So we cleaned it up, and that's what's there. But that's not the finished movie by. by okay, cool. Yeah, Excellent. so it, it's 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 going to get tighter, and there's a few more interviews to do. I mean, it's very close narratively. It is what it is. You're you know, that's the trajectory of the story, and that's what it, it's about. And it doesn't, it's not mean in any way. It's not. No, it's a very fun watch. It. There's something. I love seeing guys like Bob Mackey, the costume designer, you know, come back and he's still like really proud of his creations and showing off mm -hmm. his drawings and, and it's just, yeah, he was very excited to talk about his stuff for sure. Yeah. It's, it's great. And no, no one else is giving them the spotlight to do so. Um, and I think to really understand star Wars, the full scope of the brand, especially in its nascent days, you, you do have to talk about this. And it's great having a guy like, um, J.W. Rensler, um, it was sad because, you know, he passed away two months after his interview, but um, wealth of knowledge, true gentleman, and 
getting his insight into it because he spent a lot of time with George um, and studying early Lucasfilm and the brand. So really, really amazing insight into a very mysterious and untalked about time of Star Wars history. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very true. And now, a word from our show sponsor, Level Up Sabres. link can be found in the show notes. Welcome back to the FSF podcast. In addition to all of your feature films and your incredibly nerdy things that you've done, you also direct music videos for some big names like Taylor Swift and Lana Del Rey, which I thought was pretty cool. Yes, and thank you. Yeah, I love music video format. Um I got to work with Taylor Swift. I did um also did her 1989 tour. I did some stuff mm -hmm. with her for that. I'm working in these crazy, huge stadium formats. Um, I got to do some stuff with Lana Del Rey, which was awesome. Um, I just did finish another video for my fiance, and I did one for her this past summer, and Katy Perry was in that one. So I've gotten to work with some cool people in in the world of music, and I'd love it if I can... Uh, if I know the artist, um, I'd love to I can do something that's more personal or special. And it's not just like some random pitch. Like, here's a bunch of visuals. And they're like, that's cool. That's snazzy. Let's go. Like, I, it's not, that's not really for me. But I do love that it's so different than a documentary. I do like love that it's so different than a feature film. Mm -hmm. It's a totally different type of muscle to flex. It's totally different than when I'm writing books. So strangely, I guess I get into a lot of different formats you know i guess i'm doing everything from cookbooks to taylor swift videos so um, that, is, that is so cool that is such a cool variety of things to do it is yes i get to do things i like and it's different all the time and, I'm, and i couldn't be more thankful but it is it's like a, it is a struggle you know you sometimes just wish you just knew where money was coming from and you just wish you had like a set path and that responsibility in this freelance entertainment landscape, it just falls heavy on you to mm -hmm. forge a way forward. And thankfully I've been able to work on things that I love or that mean something to me. Uh, when it came to like doing videos for Taylor and Lana, they were, they were like good friends and mm -hmm. Taylor was the godmother to my second born son, you know? So it's, it's like working with somebody you're close with and it, it has a different meaning and it's special. You know, so I'm getting to do things that are, dreams you know so yeah but it's just like yeah my sometimes like I'm working on a cookbook at the same time doing a documentary it's like it's you have to just wear these different hats and it gets a little crazy and uh but i think that also helps you know you're you, you it's like sometimes if you're on your know, one train of thought you can't see things in a different way you know but if you can step outside of it because you have to work on another project totally different and come back to something mm -hmm. and you're like oh this helps solve this problem because my mind's thinking in a different way and i'm I can look at it in a way that I was never thinking of before. So those type of moments are really cool. But like I said, I'm I'm just thankful I get to work and do yeah. these, these totally different style and toned projects and totally different genres. And it is very strange. I don't know. I hope it keeps going. I hope it, uh, I hope it, uh, <laughs> it keeps providing opportunities. Um, I love that Taylor is your son's godmother too. Like that's just that's very cool. That is super cool. That's like the coolest godmother ever. <laughs> yeah, it's just, she's she's a, a pretty incredible um, woman, and I think also her. You know, what's cool about her is like her brand, her identity. Everything's her. You know, it's mm -hmm. not like there's sure. a machine or a team. She's very true to herself, and then people around help facilitate that, as opposed to people saying you need to be this, and she steps in and plays a character. Yeah, um, that's even better. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's there's there's something that's you're really truly seeing her and her taste come through in her music and the way she presents herself, which is I think um kind of rare. It feels like a lot of musicians are are karaoke, you know, there's yeah. like mm -hmm. 
so hey, you're not wrong songs and someone else is dressing them and someone else is telling them this is what looks good and mm -hmm. and um it, it's like a machine and that's fine but there's something more authentic about her as fellow nerds we like to hear origin stories and as the hero of our origin story or the hero of our story we would like to hear your origin story like what were your influences that inspired you to become a director and what what is your directorship origin story okay so i watched a lot of movies a lot of stuff that we all probably grew up on it wasn't like my parents were showing me european art films or <laughs> japanese cinema uh there was a lot of my dad liked a lot of like outlaw Josie Wales and Clint Eastwood movies and Death Wish and he would watch Western nice. and he would watch you know John Wayne and stuff like that and so he liked serials and westerns so that was around in the house we also would watch a lot of you know Star Wars and E.T. Jaws Goonies my little brother and I I had some older brothers, so I got some of their influence. I had, and then the stuff that we kind of grew up with. And my mom would let us stay home from school sometimes, and we'd just watch Aliens or Empire Strikes Back or, um, you know, Last Crusade or Ice Pirates or whatever, you know. And oh, that's a good one. I remember just those days meant staying home from school every like month or so watching movies. It was better than I remember those days more than what I didn't see at school, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was fascinated by movies and I began to realize that you know, that's a career. I was a pretty good fine artist. Like I could draw and paint, but I didn't want to sit in a studio. So I didn't really have the capacity and the, to make movies per se, like where I was in New Jersey growing up, there's no one else interested in it. And I did some stop motion animation stuff. But I didn't really have like lots of gear and casts to work with. And, you know, it just seemed daunting. So I would storyboard movies I wanted to make or or scenes or things like that. Or I would make models for movies that I wouldn't make. And then sometimes do some stop motion. And um, but I, I guess around 14 or 15, I was like, I want to be a filmmaker. You know, I just wanted to go to college for it. And I just started gearing myself towards getting into college to go to film school. I ended up going to NYU. Um which was awesome. Um, I won a Coca-Cola Refreshing Filmmakers Award. They did this inaugural uh, competition. I won that. And the short film I did ended up on like 20,000 screens one summer. And um, oh, wow, that helped me get me noticed. And I was still in school. And I also, wanted, before I graduated, I won the Martin Scorsese Award at NYU, which was another amazing thing. So just off short films I was doing. So I felt like I could step into the bigger world. And... You know, I struggled for a few years after trying to like write stuff. I got some different writing jobs, but I didn't have like a feature. And then the first feature I got was I took over for another director. It was four days into production. It was a remake of a modern day telling of a Sleepy Hollow story. And it was starring Nick Carter for the Backstreet Boys, Kaylee Cuoco, and uh, Judge Reinhold, and Eileen Brennan, who, you know, of Clue fame, Academy Award nominated actress. So, um, I stepped into this thing. Stacy Keach was in it. I was like, what am I doing here? And it was a train wreck. And I didn't read the script. I didn't know the cast. I had I didn't know any of the crew. And I just stepped on set one morning after reading the script earlier that morning. Not even reading the script. I read two scenes. I was like, sure, I'll do it. I want to work, you know? So I get the set and it was like, it was like worse than an Ed Wood film. It was horrible. It was horrible. And I went behind a shed <laughs> and was crying. I was like, oh my God, what am I doing here? This movie's awful. And I didn't even know what the story is like, and here I am in charge. People ask me questions. I was like, I felt like the biggest fraud and um, I survived it. We finished it and, you know, it was a tremendous learning experience. And then just fanboys was next. And it's every experience has been so different. Every time you think it can't get worse than this. Oh my God. I just worked with the Weinsteins. It can't get worse than this. You know, there's another curveball, but there's also something amazing. You know, I did barely lethal it's with Haley Steinfeld and Sophie Turner from Game of Thrones and Jessica Alba and Samuel L. Jackson. So I got to work with Mace Windu, you know, and awesome. I think I, I convinced him that Mace is not dead, that he should be doing his voice on Rebels and I mean, Clone Wars and, and that Mace is alive and I had a great bond with him. And, you know, and previously I got to work with 
you know, Ray Park and Carrie Fisher and Billy D. Williams. I got to know Mark Hamill because I was talking about getting him in fanboys. You know, I, I've got to meet and interact with George and Rick McCallum and they let me shoot at the ranch. So I, through all these strange movie experiences, I got to, you know, connect with Star Wars icons, which was, which was cool. And it's just, I feel like the origin story is still happening because I'm just, you're still, every time you make a movie, you're learning and then you're done. Then you got to start over again and the business keeps changing and you're going to like, well, now what? Now it's like, I just made this movie one up, which was an esports movie. And from when we started it, you know, at the very beginning of the pandemic to when it came out, like even distribution and screening it, it changed, you know, it started as one thing and it ended up as an Amazon prime movie, you know? So everything keeps evolving. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the things with this, this industry is you just gotta not reinvent yourself, but you gotta be ready to step in with fresh, fresh eyes and optimism and no set way of doing something saying what does the story require what <laughs> what do i need to do to make this moment or this sequence or this story connect with people and all your old tricks or anything you've learned may not apply i mean there's things you can apply but you you almost start fresh every time because you're not making the same thing again every movie is like like a child they're just unique you know their own right. set of problems their own set of strengths um see i think my origin story just i feel like i'm always learning you just have to act like you're you're this is your first film and they're scary because you're like you could put the camera in a hundred different places and each one has a different meaning or purpose each one will elicit a different feeling and then you have to factor that in with like your your time resources and and what you can do in the in the confines of a day and each day on a movie set is so expensive just burning through money and so there's a lot of pressure and like I said, music videos, everything's a different experience. You know, you, and in some strange way, they all, they all help you the next time, but you're also just throw it all out the window and start over. And you're like, all right, cool. here you get 12 hours go and you got to get as much crap filmed in a day as you, <laughs> as you can. <laughs> and you better get a lot because, you know, in editing, you never know what's going to work, what's going to not work. And, and sure. you get discovery somewhere else and you don't have this moment earlier. So you always have to think outside of the moment, think ahead of things and, it's like a very on your feet, agile job that demands, I think, an open mind. Interesting. You know, as much as I think something's going to work, sometimes it doesn't work. And sometimes sure. I'm totally wrong about something. I'm like, this this is, you know, no. And it's like, this is the best thing in the movie, you know? So you always have to be open to surprises and be open and receptive to like your collaborators' ideas because it's not like painting or photography. It's not like you take one image or you paint one thing and it's you. You've got all these other people that are coming to you with their passions and their inspirations. And, and if you let it hit you and you listen, you're you're going to find things that elevate, you know, the, the main thing that we're all trying to do is to make this one story special. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's a lot funnels through a director, you know? Yeah. Excellent. It's like a live action D and D game, but you're making a movie it is you know and these you have your your key people in the story with you and you know it could go a lot of different directions and sometimes you're surprised by what an actor's doing with something that's written and they're doing it a different way and sometimes it's like shaping it a new way you just it, it's you just kind of roll with it and the way an rpg is you, you you think you know where it's going as a dungeon master but players will surprise you um it's it's less random but there is that element to it interesting very cool. All right, Kyle, last question. And of course, this has to be about fanboys because um, fanboys. So I, I've already said this. I absolutely love this movie. Thank you so much for making this movie. It means the absolute world to me. And I'm not just saying this for your benefit because you're sitting here. Trust me, I talk about fanboys all the time to Nick and Kathleen. I'm pretty sure that they're sick of hearing about fanboys from me because I quote it a lot. I um, love it. Thank you. Uh, and I have so many fanboys questions, but we have so little time. So I'm just going to ask you this one because of the way that the movie is written. And you even mentioned earlier, uh, how George became very protective of star Wars IP and everything else that was associated because of the experiences that he had early on in his star Wars career. You have cameos from Carrie Fisher, Billy D Williams, Ray Park, Seth Rogen. And of course, even William Shatner is in this movie, which is 
it adds a really interesting touch. One of the few times I didn't mind seeing him on screen. Uh, but I have to ask, how much money did you guys have to drop off at George Lucas's doorstep in order to get access to the sights and sounds uh, that you guys used in this movie? Because every time I've watched this, it makes me laugh. You know, he, uh, the images that are Darth Vader, the sounds that are Darth Vader, the R2-D2 scream, there's there's so much that you guys have used from the Star Wars world and brought it into this movie that is iconic to Star Wars. So, it, yeah. Nothing. To my knowledge, we paid them zero. I think they, they had an affinity for the script. They thought it was great. Um, we hit them, I think, at a, a time right after Revenge of the Sith where he probably wasn't making any more Star Wars movies. He wasn't thinking about it. Okay. Uh, but again, he's aware that, yeah, probably want to do things to keep it alive and relevant this movie they probably read it and felt like it wasn't mean-spirited it was a celebration of, of fandom oh yeah absolutely and it was fun and it had heart um so all of those things i i think helped reassure them that tone was going to be right and then they had to like me and our producers and say okay you can do this so we had to wait for those type of george lucas approvals to come in but um once we had them, they were super popular. I mean, they would like, for years, they would advertise, like just put up clips of fanboys in their booth at Celebration or San Diego Comic-Con and oh, cool they let them shoot the ranch, which was a rare thing. No one ever got to shoot there outside of um, George's own productions, you know? So we got to do that, which was cool for a day. After we wrapped in New Mexico, we had a, a, an extra day of shooting there. Um. It, I think because they felt like we were genuine fans, we got that type of, that sure. type of access and support. Uh, it was invaluable because that authenticates the movie in an unprecedented way. Like even a little clip, like when Carrie Fisher and Chris Marquette have that scene at the hospital where they kiss. Love you. Um, I know. That I know was she didn't say that what we got was that from an unused take from return of the Jedi and Matt Wood uh, went and pulled it and we got really quick approval from George. And then he wrote to Carrie and she said, sure. And then we got, you know, she allowed us to use that line as her, I know. And um, that was something we figured out in post. We're like, Oh, why didn't she say that on set? That's so perfect. So yeah, that's like a real sound from Return of the Jedi that was just repurposed in fanboy. So they were really cool. Like, I, would that happen now? No, probably not under uh, under the way it's you know run now. They're just it's a different beast. It's uh it's under a corporation, you know, in a different sure. way. Mickey publicly Mickey. traded corporation, and things are run differently, and there's a different type of um, scrutiny on it all. So we we got we approached them and did this at a, at a very unique time in star Wars history, which was fortunate. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. If you look at it now, it's priceless. Yeah. But we didn't, I don't think we paid anything. It just was, you know, they're like, you guys are cool and this is really fun and we like the spirit of it. So yes. Yeah. I remember this just the, the first time I sat down and watched the movie. I, 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 I saw it and I read the, um, uh, the you know the write up about it and I was like, yeah, it's probably gonna suck, but we're gonna watch it anyway. And about <laughs> that was that was honestly the, how I went into the movie. I'm like, well, it's probably gonna suck, but I'm gonna watch it anyway. It's about Star Wars. Yeah. So it was like almost I almost watched it on a dare, and I am so glad that I did watch it because I found myself laughing out loud at several different parts of the movie. Um, just the casting in that movie is is phenomenal. Each Thanks. character plays that so well. The scenes are done so well. I just <laughs> there's still lines. Scene? What's your favorite? Uh, so the one that honestly still makes me laugh, and it's just a very small clip. They pull yeah. up to a to, they pull up to a restaurant uh, while they're on their on their ride, okay, and they're getting tacos, and they all lean up, and they're all wearing all four of them wearing stormtrooper helmets in the booths, and the <laughs> they scare the girl behind the counter. I laugh every single time. That and when they're at uh, uh, Riverside, Iowa, for the the birthplace of James T. Kirk, that whole, the line about uh, um, 
Well, that doesn't look anything like Khan. Thank you for noticing the whores at Viacom. That one kills me. Do you, want to know the, do you want to know the story behind that one? Yes, please. Originally, about nine days before uh, production started, we we had this agreement with Viacom to use Star Trek. We're going to really use Trek. And they pulled out. So then we rewrote it. I was like, screw Viacom and screw Trek. Um Let's box just suckers. Of what it is you know so we like drew attention to the fact <laughs> that they were way they were wearing like b-grade ripoff you know track and that you know the whores at viacom screw people so we're like look you're gonna screw us over and you're gonna be you're gonna get included in the movie as oh. the so that was <laughs> the intention was for it to um be spot on track and i like track you know i, I like star trek yeah. um and it would have been cool if it was but it's cool that it wasn't exactly track you know i think it adds so much more to the movie that it's not exactly track mm -hmm. and that it's that it's trek ish not actual sure. track yeah. mm -hmm. and i think For that sure. adds to the jokes even more um you know not to mention some of the uh uh ways that the statues were accentuated. I noticed that like on my third time watching that uh, they were very happy statues. Yeah, I was very uh, <laughs> specific to make sure Ricardo Montalban's um, lower body parts were visible on his pant leg. Yeah. Yes. I noticed, like I said, I think I noticed that about the third the third time watching and I was like, is he? Wait a minute. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> and that made it even funnier because, you know, then, you know, Come on. And, See, yeah. and I There's... think I think it did so much for the the issues that there seems to be between the Star Trek and the Star Wars fan bases too. Like I feel like that just made it that much better because then it's very much the oh look we're just gonna straight up mock you. William Shatner came down. He was like, "So uh, this great script." He's like, "Well, what's all this about Star Wars versus Star Trek?" And I was like. What do you mean? And he's like, "Are you agitating this here? There's no rivalry." And I'm like, "There's always been a rivalry." Yeah, there is. <laughs> he's talking about. And he he thought this was like something we were doing to kind of like create a rift. And I, and I was like, "What?" You know. So it's interesting. You know, here's a Star Trek icon not really realizing there's this heated Huge competition between these two. Rivalry. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, it was. Wow, what a crazy shot that whole movie in 25 days so it was a crazy time oh wow yeah that one. wow that was an awesome 25 days then so. i think it's funny though that such a that shatner wouldn't be aware of that that's like i think shatner's is... oblivious to a lot of things that are outside of well, his small shatner dome and so. understand, yeah but it is like it is as big as the <laughs> michigan ohio state rivalry and then you get shatner who's just like oh that's a thing Man's yeah. into sweater yams. Anyway, okay, I could keep going all day. But well, Kyle, thank you so much for being on our show today. Where can our listeners go to find out more about you and your works? Uh Kyle Newman um fan page on Facebook and Kyle underscore Newman on Twitter, Kyle underscore Newman Instagram. And I believe it's the holiday holiday special doc is where you can, let me just double check this. You can, um, yeah, holiday special doc, doc.com is uh, the website for disturbance in the force. And we're going to be appearing at festivals coming up many more in the next few months. Um, especially right around May 4th, May the 4th, uh, you Perfect. might see us add some in different parts of America. So, I would register there. There's going to be info. You can see the movie early in that way if you see it at a festival. Um, and I would anticipate the film coming. We don't have a set uh, release date or plan yet now, um, but it'll all be presented soon. But nothing we can talk about, but, um, you know, the fall, like somewhere close to Life Day. Cool. Awesome. Well, we will definitely link all of that so that our viewers and our listeners can... Find what you've got coming. You got some. You got some cool stuff coming out. 
Yeah, there's so much we didn't have a chance to talk about. If you go to his IMDb page as well, there's a whole bunch of stuff there. Uh, the stuff that you need to, stuff that has been released, stuff that's upcoming. You guys need to go find all that. And uh, so we want to take this opportunity too to remind you that subscribing is the single most important thing that you can do to help make sure that we get more amazing guests like Kyle Newman here today and have these fun things for you guys to listen to and, and these fun conversations to be part of. And so please subscribe. It helps us more than we can really even say, and go check out Kyle's work. I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. The man has some really cool, fun, uh, nerdy themed stuff out there, but, as always, guys, if for whatever reason you're not happy with the content of our show today, please feel free to lodge a complaint with the head of our complaint department. That, of course, is Harry Knowles from Ain't It Cool News. Send Harry your complaint in triplicate to make sure that nothing gets lost in translation. Harry will quiz the offending parties and their knowledge of Star Wars lore and trivia. And if you're not able to prove that his website isn't every geek's homepage and answer his questions properly, he will hunt you down like a T-1000. And whatever you do, don't ever email his niece, Kimmy, no matter what Rogue Leader promises to give you. <laughs> Thanks again, Kyle. Thank, Thank you, Kyle. You. This has been, been awesome. Fun. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks for checking out the movie. Thanks for all the support. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, guys, that's going to conclude us for the FSF podcast. Goodbye. Bye. Ciao. On behalf of the rest of the hosts of the FSF podcast, we want to thank you for listening to this episode. If you'd like to be a guest on a future episode, please contact us by means of Twitter or Instagram using the handle at FSF Popcast, or go to www.fsfpopcast.com and click on the contact link. Thanks again and hope you enjoyed the episode. Copyright 2023 FSF Popcast. Reference to any specific product or entity mentioned on this podcast does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by FSF Popcast. The views expressed by the guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact us via email at info at FSFpopcast.com. Original music by Jordan Michaels.